Thank you for having me back. Maybe this means a beautiful was successful. <laughs> Actually, I haven't seen it yet. I just saw the main uh, frame on the main website. But I should. I'm not that willing to listen to myself again. So, but, uh, <laughs> it's nice to know that I don't have a YouTube. So, the, uh, the title relates to me, The Human Person and Christian Anthropology, is really huge. It can cover probably two years of philosophical studies without even, you know, having a perfect picture of what it means. So my idea was to take advantage of this uh, talk uh, to help you uh, reading better the main uh, elements uh, of Christian anthropology from the main source uh, that Catholics have of their faith is the Catholic. So I will try, I don't know how much we can cover, and by the way, stop me whenever you want. How much time do I have actually? About uh, 45 minutes. 45 yes. minutes, okay, that's not that. But uh, in any case, whenever, I, whenever we need to stop, I just hope that you will have some ways to go back to read something that might look sometimes very simple, sometimes very sophisticated in capitalism, but uh, which deserves a uh, lot of attention and thought, and even imagination. I hope to touch on the, the imagination issue a uh, little bit today. And uh, so uh, the main, uh, by the way, I, I'm not sure that the term anthropology is actually clear to everybody here, because very often today it's used for something different than its original meaning. So in, this, in the context of this title, it does have its uh, uh, etymological meaning of philosophy of the human being. So technically in Greek, this is exactly what the term anthropology means. And it's still used this way in Europe. I mean, in many countries, anthropology means just philosophy of the human being, because it's uh, a composed term. So the Greek term indicating the human being, man, and the term indicating the logos, so the work of the mind. So the mind focusing on the human being. So this is what the philosophy of the human being is about. So Christian anthropology would mean what's the vision of the human being that is involved in Christian uh, revelation and teaching. And the human person might be a synonym of it, or it might mean something more technical, something that doesn't mean the same as human being or human nature. So we try to figure this out as, uh, as this talk goes by or through your questions at the end. So uh, I have, uh, I selected the three uh, parts of the Catechism we might want to look at. One is the very uh, beginning of the Catechism. You all have my outline, right? Okay, so one is the very beginning. It's the first chapter of the first part of the Catechism. The one uh, titled Man's Capacity for God. And then I, of course, selected the part from the second, uh, from the, uh, always the second, uh, the first part of the Catechism story about the, the, our creed talking about uh, uh, the human beings, somehow is the part of the Catechism, which is the little philosophical theory of the human person, the human being. So it's the traditional approach of human being being made of the body and soul. And then it's just the beginning of the third part of the Catechism, the one of moral life. So let's see why I selected these things. But my, my hope is that you will go back to read them carefully and see exactly what, uh, well, exactly not. I mean, we, we will definitely die before getting really through all these concepts, but at least we can look at them and read them again with uh, kind of a new interest. And uh, so, I guess the main, uh, my main uh, goal tonight is uh, to give you another vision. So what are we supposed to be? according to the Christian uh, faith. Uh, so, first of all, I would say, we are supposed to be uh, weird, very weird beings. Some, some kind of fairy tale beings. Actually, I like this because I, I love Tolkien, as some of you know. And uh, actually, he had this idea that uh, a 
fete fantasy, the word he used for fete, is uh, probably the highest way to look at uh, uh, it ourselves in the world. Because the world needs some fantasy to be understood properly and to, to understand our role in the world. Because the world is magic, as Chesterton liked to say too. Hmm? Why it is magic? Because if we look at it and at ourselves correctly, we are not dealing just with something material, something that ends in this world, but we are dealing with something that actually relates to something else, something that is, is still to happen after we die. So it's like a mixture between natural and supernatural, between earthly things and uh, uh, heavenly things. So we are supposed to be weird creatures, very weird uh, animals who actually live their lives aiming at something that doesn't belong to this world. And uh, so this is our main self-understanding as Christians. We do belong to two different world, worlds at the same time. And uh, I would say that when we approach Christian anthropology, this is the main idea we should keep in mind. We should start with this idea. We don't belong properly to the world as it appears to us right now. We belong to something different. This is why we are kind of fairy tales characters, right? We are actually walking a path that ends somewhere else, the Tolkien's like to say, you know, somewhere uh, 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 beyond the mountains we can see. So nobody knows exactly what's behind, uh, what's beyond these mountains, but that's where we are going. So it's kind of mystery. And uh, so the, the catechism actually begins in a kind of uh, uh, strange way too. So it doesn't begin with God, it begins with the human beings, which is kind, kind of strange. I don't know if you ever focused on it. But we, in, when we open the catechism, we are supposed to know what God revealed to the human beings. So it should start with the relation, with what he wanted to tell the human beings, some truth he wanted to reveal to us. But actually, it doesn't begin that way. It begins to this kind of uh, uh, complicated chapter. It is very complicated on man's capacity for God, in Latin, homo capax dei. Uh, why is that? The reason why the Hakim starts this way is that even before God can even can think of revealing something to us, we should be beings able to receive the message. If we were, I don't know, dogs, I love dogs, I always use dogs or leaders as examples, but so if we were dogs, and somebody wanting to tell us something about uh, physics. Actually, even before thinking about giving the dogs this message, should make the dogs able to know about physics. Otherwise, this, the very message would be impossible. So, even before wondering what exactly, how God revealed something to us, we should focus exactly on who we are, why we are able to receive this message. So the main, the bottom line is that God created us in such a way that we not only can, but are supposed to receive this message. So God can tell something to us only if we are able to receive the message. So if you look at the very table of content in the Catechism, if you just open it and look at it, the part with the profession of faith starts with man's capacity for God. And now we will get a little bit deeper into it. But what it means is that, first of all, we need to figure why we can receive the message. Then God can come to meet man. So it's the second chapter. So God comes to us because we are fitting to receive whatever he is and he wants to tell us. And then, chapter 3, we answer to God. So our answer to God is the third step, the third step of this process. 
So it's like saying the, the, what we are supposed to talk about today, Christian anthropology, is actually the very premise of our faith. We can talk about Christian revelation and Christian truth because we are a certain kind of people, beings. So the way the Catechism frames this in, the first, in this first chapter is the way it is a very uh, sophisticated way. I say sophisticated because it took, uh, let's say, for reaching this kind of uh, uh, refinement that we find today in the Catechism, it took probably about uh, 12, 13 centuries of Christian thought. So the Catechism, these three, four pages of this first chapter, are kind of a summary of about 12, 13 centuries of uh, Christian thought about human beings. And they kind of uh, summarize it in two main features of the human being. One is our desire for God, and the other one is our uh, understanding of God, our way to know God. So basically the main, uh, two main concepts involved here are the, our uh, intellect being able to reach the knowledge of God, starting with the things which are around us. And the second is our will, our appetite, the appetite to our uh, rational nature to actually aim at God and find its true happiness and fulfillment in God, which means not in this world. So let's go back to the fake day thing. So we are kind of weird uh, beings who are looking for something that is not here. So if we were not believers, we would be very much frustrated. So because we know that we are doomed, we would know that we would be doomed to, to fail to a kind of happiness we cannot reach. We aim at the eternal life. What does that mean, eternal life? What is eternal in this world? I mean, some of you might tell his or her lover, I love you forever, but this forever doesn't mean much, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a great <laughs> uh, feeling, I mean, it's a great thing to say to your lover, but uh, if you focus on it as, a, you know, we will not be much love, but with a lot of intellectual effort, I mean, the sentence is meaningless, right? Because our forever is very limited. We die. I mean, and some people who really love their lovers might feel very bad about it. So there is something I cannot do with. For you, I cannot assure you that I will always be there. I cannot be there for you if I die. My power stops at my limited condition. I know that forever for me is something I aim at, but I cannot reach by myself in this world. So I really, when I focus on what, I, what my ambitions are, my moral ambitions, my fulfillment, I'm actually looking at something which is not here. I'm, I need God. That's God. That's the kind of perfect happiness, living forever. Actually, many uh, thinkers in other times got very frustrated. They thought that we were uh, uh, the example of an animal which is doomed to think about this, which is impossible. So we, the only outcome would be to be frustrated. So freedom as a kind of uh, damnation, freedom to think at our promotion. But of course, for Christians, it doesn't work this way. We are supposed to look at something else. You know, for, let's go back to our master, Tolkien. Tolkien, actually, when he uh, thought of the human beings and the elves, I mean, apparently, the elves are superior to human beings, right? I mean, they look powerful, they can, uh, uh, as, uh, as when Frodo is uh, escaping from the, the knights and whatever they call it in the English, but yeah, sorry? Uh, no, it's cool. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not repeating it. But, uh, 